In isolation, they develop distinctive traits. Their hair color changed, the shape of their noses changed, even their height. Today, people with European ancestors, like me and these French bull players, look pretty different from our distant relatives. But why had it taken our ancestors so long to arrive here? Whatever kind of journey they made, it's clear that they developed a whole new range of life skills along the way. So why did it take my ancestors 10,000 years to get to Europe from the Middle East? And why had they changed so much? The accepted theory was that they made their way around the Mediterranean and up through Turkey. Then, our research threw a wrench in the works. Until relatively recently, we had no reason to doubt that the first Europeans had followed a direct route out of the Middle East. And then, quite by chance, we uncovered evidence that they'd come from somewhere else entirely. Turns out, when they left the Middle East, my European ancestors went on a tough and grueling detour. I'm going to pick up their genetic trail in a faraway land that begins long after these rail tracks have run out. As the sampling of the world's populations mounted, I tackled one of the greatest genetic blind spots of the world. Since childhood, I've been fascinated by characters from along the Silk Road traders and travelers like Marco Polo, and conquerors like Genghis Khan. I traveled to the ex-Soviet republics of Central Asia, little known parts of the world, to sample the blood of their descendants. In this isolated land, I collected the blood of over 2,000 people. That was when we discovered that their blood held a remarkable secret, an ancient marker. I recognized it immediately. Nearly every man in Western Europe was carrying it, from Norway to Spain, Ireland to Austria. So my European ancestors hadn't taken the obvious route from Africa via the Middle East. Instead, they had passed through Central Asia 40,000 years ago. Honing their hunting skills and adapting to the colder temperatures, these African hunters followed the grasslands into modern-day Kazakhstan. The discovery of the Central Asian marker had changed our understanding of the journey made by the first Europeans. But was Europe the only destination for these formidable Central Asian hunters? Did their journey take them anywhere else? We widened our search and were in for an even bigger surprise. The markers seemed to be everywhere we looked, from Europe through Asia, Russia, North and South America, the list seemed to be endless. We'd uncovered an astounding secret. If Africa was the cradle of mankind, then Central Asia was its nursery. A bizarre sea of faces. And you can tell so much from a face. Or can you? Where are we now? We could be anywhere across the continent of Eurasia. But in fact, we're right at the very heart of it, in Central Asia. China is a few miles in that direction. Afghanistan, a few hundred miles to the south. This is really the crossing point, the central part of the continent of Eurasia. And I've come back for a very special reason. Hidden in the samples of those 2,000 Central Asians was one extraordinary individual. His name is Niazov, and he's directly descended from the man whose DNA, 40,000 years ago, had a tiny spelling mistake, the Central Asian marker. This genetic marker has spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere and been inherited by over a billion people. Branches of Niazov's ancestors went on to people Europe, parts of India, Russia, and America. But Niazov's family has always stayed here. Analyzing his DNA for the first time was an extraordinary moment. In an instant, I knew we'd discovered something very important. Now we're going to meet him, 
After nearly 2,000 generations, Niazov still lives in Central Asia. I'm excited about meeting him again, now that I fully understand the history he holds in his blood.